Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first installment of the Money Matters webinar series. I'm Vanessa Laurel with Capacity for Health, and I will be the facilitator for today's session. We have a few housekeeping items to go over before we begin, so bear with me. Let's do a quick audio check. Um, participants are currently on mute. If you have not done so, please go ahead and enter your access code and PIN so that you can hear us and fully participate in today's webinar. And the way to do that is, let me just quickly show you what you're looking for. Right here in the audio mode section, you should have your access code and PIN showing up. And please go ahead and enter that so that we can unmute you when need be. Um, to participate in this webinar and ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to use the questions chat feature right underneath, I believe, the audio portion section that I, that I showed you. Make good use of that, um, as Lynn Shank will definitely um, answer your questions as we go along. You may also use your, the raise your hand feature. And once you do that, I will go ahead and call on you and unmute you to go ahead and, to go ahead and ask that question that you have. Um, please note that the webinar will be audio recorded and published on our website, which is www.capacityforhealth.org. And so I wanted to let you know that this webinar is hosted by us, Capacity for Health, a capacity building assistance project of the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum with offices in San Francisco and Washington, D.C. We are funded by the Centers for Disease Control and prevention to provide free trainings and webinars, one-on-one -on -one tailored capacity building assistance, and resources in three main content areas. Today's webinar falls under the organizational infrastructure and program sustainability content area. We also do work in other component areas, such as evidence-based interventions and public health strategies, and monitoring and evaluation. We are very pleased to have Lin Shang Lu join us today and present on the topic of financial statements. Lin Shang, will you please go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to say a few quick words about myself. I work for Praxis Consulting Group. We're an organizational development firm, and we work with both nonprofits as well as employee-owned companies. Um, we do everything from strategic planning to board development, to leadership development, to financial literacy training. Um, my background is actually in kind of for-profit business, um, but I most recently spent three years working at Nonprofit Finance Fund. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the organization, but I did a lot of financial literacy training and financial planning and management consulting for nonprofits. Um, so now that you have a little bit of background on me, I'd love to get a sense of who is listening. Um, so I was wondering if all of you can sort of find the chat box on the GoToMeeting um, and actually type in kind of uh, the name of your organization um, and then your role, whether um, you're an ED or program director um, or a board member, um, and just go ahead and send that in so I can see who's in here. Um, and just make sure that you send it to organizers and panelists. So I'll wait a few moments as you're doing that. And while we're doing that, Vanessa, I was wondering if you can pull up the poll. Sure. So I'm not seeing any responses so far. I think so what's going on is um, it's being sent to me. So we okay. have um, from Harm Reduction Coalition senior, a senior SEBA specialist, Adam, and a board member from Community Partners, so Sharon McCall, and a program director, Camille. Uh, Shanna is an evaluation specialist with public health. And Peter is with the AIDS HIV Services Group, who is an executive director. And we have Guillermo Millo from the Comprehensive AIDS Program at Palm Beach County. Great, great. Um, so I'd also like to get a sense of the budget size of your organization. Um, so Vanessa, would you are you able to pull yes. up the poll for that? Yes. So um, while Vanessa's doing that, I guess I just wanted to clarify that when you send something into the chat box, 
um, make sure it says organizers and panelists, um, especially when you're asking questions. And that way, I can see them right away and be able to answer your questions. And since we have a fairly small group today, um, you know, please feel free to ask questions as we're going along. Um, financial information can be difficult to understand. Um, and so um, please ask questions so I can make sure I'm addressing them. Um, so in the meantime, um, please uh, fill out what you know your organization's budget is. Um, and if you're not sure, feel free to skip it. Um, but sometimes it's nice to have a sense of um, what are the size of the different organizations in the room. Um, and uh, I guess while Vanessa is doing that, um, I guess I just wanted to talk quickly about the goals of today's presentation. Um, this is really meant to be an introduction uh, to financial statements for the absolute beginner. Um, we're going to go through a lot of basic concepts today. Um, and hopefully, um, you'll be able to walk away today having a better understanding of key concepts on financial statements, um, how to read financial statements better, and how to be able to link it better to what's happening in your organization, um, as well as improving your ability to uh, you know, kind of ask um, critical questions about financial information. So it looks like the poll results are in. Um, so about 25% of you are very small with organizations less than 250,000. Um, about half of you are in organizations from a million to five million. Um, and then about a quarter of you are greater than 5 million. Um, so it looks like we have a really wide range of organizations. Um, luckily, the, the rules for um, looking at financial statements are pretty similar across the board. So I think this will be helpful for all of you. Um, but once again, I do encourage you to ask questions. Um, so Vanessa, would we be able to switch back to me so that I can pull up my slides? So I believe that all of you can see my slides right now. Um, all right, sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of dive right in and get started. Um, so there are many, many different sources that you can go to in order to get financial information. Um, so kind of the first source of financial information um, are generally um, internally prepared documents. Um, so these are generally prepared by a treasurer, a CFO, or a bookkeeper in your organization. Um, so most organizations are going to have, um, oh, I'm sorry, seem to be having some technical difficulty here. Um, I'm going to just keep talking. I'm sorry about the challenge with the slides. Um, but there are kind of budget and projections, which are internally prepared documents. Um, and these are generally used for planning. Um, so they show what your nonprofit expects to receive in revenue and send out in expenses over the next year or the next couple of years. Um, you might also see um, what are called YTD actuals or year-to-date actuals or year-end actuals. Um, and sometimes these are called YTD profit and loss statement, um, year-end uh, profit and loss, year-end income statement. Um, and these are generally used for monitoring and planning, right? So the year-to-day actuals will show you from the beginning of the fiscal year to um, whatever the most recent month is, whereas the year-end generally covers a full year. Um, and a lot of times, if you're internal to the organization or if you're on the board, um, these are the documents that you're going to be seeing the most frequently um, on a quarterly or monthly basis. Um, there are also external documents. Um, and these are reports that are prepared by an external CPA firm. Um, you'll notice here that the IRS Form 990 um, is actually only partially shaded. Um, and that's because nonprofits frequently have a CPA firm prepare this document, but it can also be prepared by the nonprofit. Um, and it's basically a tax document that you provide to the IRS um, in order to maintain your tax deductible status. Um, I think any organization um, with gross receipts over 25000 have to submit this document. Um, and also, this information is generally made publicly available on GuideStar. So it's also a kind of a public financial document from that perspective. Um, you'll also notice that I have um, audit review and compilation uh, grouped together down here. Um, and that's because um, these documents are all prepared by an external CPA firm. And they all look similar. Um, in other words, they all tend to have um, kind of an income statement, a balance sheet, a cash flow statement, and then they often have a set of notes behind them. Even though they look similar, they actually all have different degrees of assurance provided by the CPA firm. 
So the audit um, really has the highest degree of reliability. The CPA firm will come in. They're going to do a lot of testing and analysis. Um, they're going to inspect minutes and contracts. They'll check a few transactions. They'll interview key people. Um, and at the end of the day, their audit, they're going to provide assurance that your statements fairly represent the financial position of your nonprofit. The review um, is similar to that, but there is less testing involved. It takes less time, and the CPA firm only provides limited assurance that the financial statements are accurate. Um, and then finally, the compilation is really just taking raw financial data and making it look pretty. Um, most funders um, will require an audit rather than a review or compilation for funding applications. Um, there's also different regulations associated with uh, kind of federal and state funders. Um, Generally speaking, um, if you're a very, very small organization, 100000 200000 budget, it may not make sense to spend ten dollars or $20,000 getting an audit. Um, but as you get to that three hundred dollars or 400000 threshold, you're going to have to start thinking about doing it. Um, so I'm guessing on this call, most of you will have uh, an audit for your organization. Um, a lot of times people don't like looking at uh, these externally prepared documents. Uh, most of the time, that's because they're not available until two or six months two to six months or eight months after the fiscal year end. So people think, well, this is old information. Um, it's, not, you know, it's not up to date. It's not useful. Um, but they're still very important to look at. Um, they're third-party, independently prepared financials. Um, they have a very high degree of reliability. Um, and they're kind of the comprehensive and cleanest version of your financial information. Um, and since a lot of times your funders, uh, foundations, as well as government, require this audit, it's really good to kind of know um, what's in it and what it says about your organization. Today we're going to be focusing both on internals, um, internal actuals, as well as audits. Um, and both of them follow similar principles, but there can be some tricky differences. But I want to kind of go over both so that we can um, make sure that you feel comfortable reading both. So I wanted to um, do a quick poll. and see if I can handle the, the technical elements of this, um, to kind of ask all of you to see which documents do you regularly look at. Um, Vanessa, can we pull up the poll, please? So i um, love to hear how many of you regularly look at budgets, um, internal year-to-date or year-end income statements, um, how many of you actually look at an internal balance sheet. Um, or Form 990 or an audit. Um, and if you don't know what some of these statements are, we'll be going through them throughout today's call, um, but just answer them to the best of your ability. And so it looks like all of you um, look at budgets, um, and the majority of you um, look at some of these other statements. Um, and um, that's, you know, I'm actually pleasantly surprised to see how many of you actually look at the Form 990 and audit, um, because we frequently encounter people, especially um, people who aren't board members or ED, who never really look at the Form 990 or the audit, really only look at the internal information. So I'm really happy to see that a lot of you look at that. Um, all right, Vanessa, would I be able to switch back to me? All right, great. So um, we're going to dive in and take a look at the actual financial statements. So I'm going to skip that. That's just the poll. So they're really, um, in all these different sources of financial information, um, there are specific financial statements. And the two um, main pillars, if you'll have it, of financial statement are the income statement and balance sheet. Um, all other reports that you might get um, are all derived from the income statement and balance sheet. So what do I mean by that? For instance, a cash flow statement is actually a reconciliation between the income statement and balance sheet that tells you how you're spending cash. Um, the accounts receivable report is actually a detail on one of the line items in the balance sheet. Um, so today, we're really just going to focus on the income statement and balance sheet. If you can understand these two statements really well, um, it's much easier to understand all the other financial reports that you might see. So people always say that an income statement is like a video camera. It tracks activity and movement over time. It shows financial resources coming into the organization, um, usually in the form of grants and fees, 
um, and also shows financial resources leaving the organization, generally in the form of paying off vendors and salaries. In contrast, people say a balance sheet is like a photo in time. It captures what a nonprofit owns and owes at a specific point in time. So sometimes I like to think about this in terms of a medical supply room in a clinic. So a medical supply clinic in a clinic is going to have clean syringes, it's going to have alcohol, it's going to have rubber gloves, all the things that are critical to providing sanitary health care. An income statement for the medical supply room um, is going to track shipments of new supplies coming in, um, that would be the revenue, and supplies that are leaving the room and being used up, right, that would be the expenses. Um, the income statement would also capture the change in supplies over the period. Are there now more, are there more supplies coming in than going out, or are there more supplies going out rather than coming in? A balance sheet for the medical supply room um, would tell you what's in the room at a specific point in time, say 5 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. How many syringes are on the shelves? How many rubber gloves are there? Are there? What, what is in this room at this specific point in time? Now, you can see that the balance sheet and the income statement are obviously connected, right? So what goes in and out of this medical supply room is going to affect what's um, in the room at any given time. But the income statement and balance sheet are going to give you different perspectives on what's happening. Income statement is tracking movement, shipments in and out. Balance sheet is going to track what's there at a specific point in time. So let me take a pause and see if there are any questions. Um, you can feel free to type them in or you can raise your hand. Um, I'm not seeing any, so I'm going to keep going. But if you do have questions, please um, send them in. Um, and I'll make sure that I answer them. So we're going to take a specific look at the income statement and balance sheet today. But before we do that, I have to cover one other accounting principle. Um, and this is looking at two different types of accounting methods. Um, whenever I teach accounting, I always say that it's um, it's, a, it's like a learning a language, right? Accounting is a way of describing and representing the world. And so you have to learn a specific vocabulary, and um, you also have to learn the grammar rules. Um, so these two accounting methods are kind of like the grammar rules of accounting. Um, so they're basically two main methods. One is called cash. Uh, the other is called accrual. And they're basically two different ways of recognizing financial transactions. Easiest to explain this with examples. So um, let's take an example of a medical clinic that provides services to its patients free of charge and then later bills the government um, for Medicaid reimbursement for every patient that it sees. The medical clinic doesn't actually receive the cash from the government until several months later. So under cash-based accounting, the medical clinic would recognize revenue for the services that it provided when it actually gets the cash from the government. That's when on the income statement it would record cash for services. Um, so in, in cash-based accounting, um, it's, it's like your checkbook. Cash is the trigger for everything that happens, right? Um, and it's, it's fairly intuitive because whenever you get cash, cash in, you deposit into your bank, that's when you recognize a transaction. Whenever you write a checkout, um, that's when you're recognizing expenses. Now, accrual accounting, which is the, the standard method accepted in the United States, recognizes transactions based on what's called the matching principle. And the basic idea is that you're trying to match revenue and expenses to when service or product delivery happens. So for that earlier example I gave, when the medical clinic provides services to the patient and then it bills the government for the, those services, that's when it would recognize revenue, even though it's not receiving cash for it until later. Well, what would happen is that on its balance sheet, it would create something called accounts receivable that would represent the fact that the government owes them cash for those services. Now, accrual accounting is a lot trickier. It's a lot more things to keep track of. Um, but it's also better at showing the net profitability of providing a service or providing a product because you're able to match revenue and expenses to when that service delivery occurs. That being said, both um, forms can be misleading. Um, so for instance, if we take the cash method in that example I was talking about, imagine this organization um, builds the government for their services. I'm sorry, I'm having computer trouble, so I'm sorry that the screen keeps changing. But um, I'm going to keep going through this example. Um, so um, 
I'm, I lost my train of thought. Let me start over. So if you use the cash method, um, so imagine this organization um, has built the government for providing all these services, um, and then it hasn't received the cash from the government yet. Um, but it's already written out checks to pay for all the nurses, for the doctors, for the admin staff um, during this time period. So if you were looking at the income statement for this organization, they would be showing a large deficit. Um, but that's somewhat misleading, right? Because you know that the government is eventually going to pay them for those services. So that's not entirely true. Accrual method could also be misleading. So imagine that this organization can bill the government for more money than it costs to provide the services during that time. So during this time period, this organization you know, could bill the government for 400000 and maybe it only costs 300000 to provide those services it would show a $100,000 surplus. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean the organization has the cash at that point in time. So even though it has a profit, it may have less cash than it did at the beginning of the period. Um, so with accrual accounting, you have to be careful to know that surpluses or profits don't necessarily mean more cash. In order to figure that out, you actually have to look at the balance sheet. So let me take a pause there and see if there are any questions. And I'm not seeing anything yet, so once again, please feel free to ask questions if you have any. Um, but I will keep going. Um, Actually, Lin Shang, there's a there's someone who would like to speak, and that's Shanna. Go ahead, Shanna. I've unmuted you. Shanna, are you there? Okay, I think Shanna's having technical difficulties as well. Perhaps you can go ahead and um, type in your question, please. Oh, I think I see it up top. Um, do all you? Or, oh, this is a great question. So, do all organizations use both methods? Um, so, in general, um, most larger organizations are going to use accrual-based accounting, um, whereas smaller organizations, maybe two hundred and fifty thousand and lower, are going to use cash-based because it's easier. Um, Generally, and then there, there's also this other method that's kind of in between the two that's called modified cash that sometimes organizations will use. Um, but the, for the most part, smaller organizations will use cash, larger ones are going to use accrual. Um, so I think for most of you who have budget sizes over 500,000, um, your organization most likely uses accrual accounting. All right. Um, I'm going to keep going, but once again, if you have questions, please type them in, um, and I'll try to make sure I respond to them. Um, so we're looking right now at an income statement, or at least the line items from an income statement. Um, and the income statement is sometimes called the profit and loss statement or the statement of activities. Um, and you know the revenue side is fairly straightforward. You're looking at um, contributions, grants, government revenue. There's a line item called net assets released, which I will get to later. Um, but you also might see other line items, uh, such as program service revenue, interest income, rental income, donations. Um, you're also going to see your expenses down below here. And these are generally going to be um, in your audit. It's going to be under what are called functional categories. So that's kind of the program, general and admin, and fundraising breakdown. Um, in your internal financial statements, you'll usually see them grouped by natural categories, rent and utilities, salary, supplies. Um, and then at the very bottom of your income statement, um, you'll have your change in net assets. Um, so that's a fancy way of basically saying um, profit and loss, surplus or deficit, um, or I like to think about it as change in net worth. Um, so thinking back to the medical supply room, did the number, total number of supplies in the room go up or did they go down? So this is pretty straightforward. Um, but unfortunately, for nonprofits, there's this other thing that makes the income statement a lot more complicated. Um, and many of you may already know this, um, but we're basically talking about revenue restrictions. Um, so as many of you know, um, for nonprofits, donors can actually place restrictions around the revenue they give you. Um, so that actually creates three categories of revenue that your organization can receive. 
Um, there are, there's unrestricted revenue, which actually has no donor restrictions on it. And these are the most flexible financial resources that your organization can, can receive. Because you can basically spend it however you want to spend it, or you can save it. Um, it's really, really flexible money um, and, and very easy to use. Um, there's also temporarily restricted revenue, um, which can either be time restricted, so a donor gives you a check that says that you have to spend that grant um, in 2012 and 2013, not in 2010. Um, or it could be purpose restricted. So you might receive a grant that says that you have to spend it on needles for your needle exchange program, or you have to use it for salaries for your education program. Revenue can also be permanently restricted, um, which oftentimes is called an endowment. Um, and that's basically when a donor gives you an amount of money um, that actually can never be touched. It's kind of put into investments, and the principal amount of that investment can never be accessed. Rather, the organization can use interest and dividends um, that come from that investment or a certain drawdown percentage for operations or for a restricted purpose. Um, so the classic example of this is a university endowment. Um, so the, the primary invest endowment is never touched but interest and dividends can be used to pay for scholarships, uh, might be used to pay for a professor's salary in the case of an endowed chair. Um, another example of this would be um, cemeteries actually often have endowments, um, small ones, for the maintenance of certain family plots. So let's take a look at how these restrictions are going to play out in an audited financial statement. So you'll see here we have a sample audit statement. This is a health clinic. Um, dollars are in thousands, um, and this isn't a real client, um, but I've created it so that it reflects uh, many of the issues that we've seen clients face in the past. A little bit exaggerated, but it, you know, we tried to mirror some of those um, the circumstances that organizations face. So you'll see that there's actually three different columns representing each um, of the different types of restrictions. And I'm going to try and get the spotlight on so I can actually kind of show the different areas. Um, so nonprofit finance fund, the organization I used to work for, likes to use this bucket analogy. So you can imagine each of these columns being like a bucket for financial resources and these revenue flowing into each of these different buckets. So let me walk through this line by line. So this organization in contributions received $2 million total in contributions this year. $500,000 of that uh, was an endowment contribution. So some donor, probably maybe through a request, gave $500,000 to this organization. Um, and then there's another $500,000 um, that was temporarily restricted. So in revenue that um, needs to be spent on a specific purpose or in future years. The organization also received $1 million um, that falls into this unrestricted bucket. And this is where it gets a little tricky. Um, these contributions could both be um, abs um, completely unrestricted, so not have any donor restrictions. Um, but the auditor can also include uh, restricted funds that the organization received this year uh, where the restrictions were fulfilled in the same year. Um, so it's possible this organization got contributions to purchase medical supplies, um, and they purchased those supplies this year, um, and that revenue may just show up in here. Um, we don't know. Um, let me walk through the grants line. Similar story, $2.5 million of total contributions, but $1.5 million of that had restrictions on it. $1 million um, was unrestricted or was restricted, but those restrictions were fulfilled this year. And then this government, um, sorry, the medical clinic also received $3 million in government funds, which were all unrestricted. Um, generally speaking, a lot of the kind of government reimbursement contracts or grants that you receive are unrestricted funding, um, even though that's a little bit misleading because a lot of times there are a lot of restrictions and requirements that go along with them. Um, but currently in the uh, world of accounting, they're generally recognized as unrestricted. And then finally, there's this line item called net assets released from restriction. And you'll notice that it's 400000 here and minus 400000 over here. Um, this basically shows that in this year, um, this organization um, basically released $400,000 from their temporarily restricted bucket into the unrestricted bucket. Um, and basically, that happens when the nonprofit is about to spend those funds on the specified purpose. It's either the right time 
this was money that they were allowed to spend in that year, um, or they're about to use it for the specific purpose. They're about to buy needles, or they're about to pay salaries for their education program. And when this happens, it's said that net assets are released from restrictions. You transfer it from one bucket to the other. We also noticed afterwards that we have a total revenue line. Um, so that seven, this organization received $7.5 million in total revenue, but we can see the breakdown of what the restrictions were. So 500,000 of it was permanently restricted. 1.6 million is kind of in that holding pen, that temporarily restricted bucket. They did receive that revenue, but they're not going to be able to spend it this year. And then they also had 5.4 million of unrestricted revenue, which also includes the amount that was released this year from temporary restrictions. And it's really this $5.4 million that the organization can actually use this year to cover their costs that they incur this year. Now you'll notice on the expense side um, that all the expenses are unrestricted. This is standard accounting practice. Um, temporarily restricted revenue has to first become released into the unrestricted revenue bucket um, before it can be used to pay for expenses. Um, the idea is that you can only use what's in the unrestricted bucket to pay for your expenses. And finally, we get down to the change in net assets, or basically the profit and loss line. Um, so just take a moment and think about it. Um, there's a lot of numbers here. Um, so which one do you want to be paying attention to? So that's a bit of a trick question. Um, the question, uh, the answer is that they're, they're actually all important. Um, a lot of times people will say that they look at this total number, so 1.5 million. Um, and that is a very good number to look at because it tells you the total net increase in financial resources for this nonprofit. Did they get more supplies or less supplies in this period? Um, but it also doesn't tell the whole story, right? It could be misleading because this organization, out of that 1.5 million net increase, $500,000 was an endowment um, that may give off 5000 10000 in interest and dividends each year, um, but for other purposes can never ever be touched or used. This organization also got $1.6 million um, in temporarily restricted funds. It could be a really good sign for future years. It may mean they're building a pipeline of activity and uh, donor interest, but at the same time, um, it's also not available to use in this year. And it's when we get into this unrestricted column that we get a best sense of whether or not the organization covered its costs um, with uh, revenue it had available this year. So in this case, this organization actually had a pretty large deficit, minus 600000 So let me pause there, um, and let me see if there are any other questions about the income statement. And I also encourage you um, to type in any other terms that you come across on the income statement that you'd like an explanation for. Um, so sometimes um, I'm happy to talk about uh, in-kind contributions or depreciation, if any of you have questions about that, um, or any other questions that you might have. So let me just wait a few moments to see um, if any of you have questions. I'm not seeing anything so far, um, so I'm going to keep going. But once again, I encourage you to ask if anything comes up. Um, so this is what all of this information looks like um, on uh, the audit. Um, so we're going to take a look at it um, on your internal financial statements. Um, and the tricky part about that is that it can actually look different um, depending on what accounting software your organization uses. So I'm just going to show you two examples. To give you a sense of what some of the possibilities are, um, and then some tips for what you should pay attention to when you're looking at internal financial statements. Um, Chang, I'm sorry to interrupt, but before you go, mm -hmm. can you please um, answer Shanna's question about how should an organization represent the full amount of government funding if it is a grant that is given across the years? So that's a great question. Um, so let me go back to that. What will usually happen for that sort of government grant is that in the year you receive it, um, it's going to show up in this temporarily restricted column. Um, so um, you know, maybe in the government grant column, it might show up as $3 million. Um, and in the first year, it's going to maybe they can spend $1 million of it. So it would show 
either kind of one million here and two million here, or it might actually show that transfer of one million. Um, and then in future years, what you'll see is that there'll be releases of additional money from the temporarily restricted bucket to this unrestricted bucket as time goes on. So you're going to see that full amount of that multi-year grant show up in the temporarily restricted column the year that it's received. And then over the next couple of years, you're going to see it um, as being released into that unrestricted column. Um, and that's actually a very common situation that organizations face. That they'll have kind of a peak um, in the year where they get the multi-year grant. Um, they'll have a very huge surplus. And then in future years, they actually end up having a deficit in this column because um, they're kind of drawing down on that money. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Um, and if it doesn't, please uh, feel free to ask a follow-up question. I'm going to keep going, and then, um, but you know, I'll respond if there is another question related to that. Um, so I just want to show a couple examples of internal financial statements. Um, so here is one example. If I can get my computer to work. I seem to be having some trouble. All right, so while I try and struggle with this, I'm going to just keep talking. OK, it showed up all now. So this is one example over here. Um, and what you see is in this top part, instead of having multiple columns, um, the unrestricted activity shows up here. And then you're going to get that unrestricted surplus or deficit, that minus 600,000 showing up on the profit and loss or surplus and deficit column. And then below that, um, you're going to have a summary um, of all the other restricted activity. So you see that final 1.5 million uh, total profit um, at the very bottom in this kind of other section. Um, so this is a pretty common representation that you'll often see in accounting software. Um, here's another example over here. And um, this is sometimes accounting software isn't very well adapted to um, treat nonprofit accounting. Um, and so they'll actually combine restricted and unrestricted together. Um, so what you're getting here is the unrestricted and permanently restricted and temporarily restricted revenue is all lumped together. Um, so you'll notice when you go to that profit and loss line, um, it actually shows the 1.5 million, um, so that total amount. Um, so you have to be really, really careful about this. Um, I think most of you are working for larger organizations. So it's I, I, this is probably less of a problem, though sometimes small organizations often face challenges with this. Um, but um, you really want to be careful when you look at your internal financial statements to ask yourself, how are restricted funds being treated? Um, where are they showing up? Um, and how is that going to affect um, how you interpret the information? Um, because the worst thing is you don't want to think your organization is having this $1.5 million surplus when it's actually running a $600,000 deficit. Um, so the really big takeaway is to kind of learn how your financial statements are treating restrictions. Um, and then um, depending on the size of your organization and the types of reporting requirements from your funders, um, you may occasionally need to upgrade your accounting software. Um, QuickBooks, which is what a lot of small organizations use, um, actually, um, uh, I'm, so actually is not um, very well adapted to work with nonprofit financial statements. And so the danger is using QuickBooks for too long and not upgrading uh, to something more sophisticated that's going to be able to handle restrictions uh, better as your organization gets more complicated. So let me pause there um, and see if there are any questions. Um, and I also want to ask you to kind of type into the chat box um, to ask kind of what do you pay attention to when you look at the income statement? Um, or when you look at your budgets, um, what are the numbers that you pay attention to? Um, what are the line items that you like to focus on? So I'll give you guys a few moments to do that. Um, and I'm actually not entirely sure if I'm going to be able to see those responses. So Vanessa, you may have to read them out to me if anyone sends anything. Um, or if it seems like you're all shy, then we can pass and just I can give you all the answers. Uh, all right, well, I'm not getting anything yet, so I'm going to keep going. Um, I have another question in. Um, and actually, I'm not seeing it typed in. So if you could either send it to me or unmute the person, um, that would be great. 
Actually, Lin Shang, I think I can't unmute them unless um, you change presenters back. But Shannon oh. asked a question about how is it best to show financials if you receive a grant, but it is based on reimbursement? It will always look like a de deficit. It, I, um, I'd have to have no more details about the situation. Um, if it's a reimbursement contract, uh, generally speaking, whenever you provide the services, um, you'll be able to book the revenue for that. Um, and so it, I, I'm not sure if I understand the specifics, but maybe um, after the webinar I can ask a few more questions about what you're specifically thinking of and try and answer that for you. And then in terms of what you just recently asked, Guillermo looks at all the income line items, and Camille looks at the revenue and expenses section. OK, great. So um, here is a, a, a little sheet to kind of go through what I usually look at when I take a look at a multi, like a financial statement. Generally speaking, I like to look at it um, over a multiple year period. So this is 2008 through 2010. Um, and uh, I usually find it helpful to compare it to something. It's hard to look at numbers on their own. Um, and so um, for those of you, uh, you may want to look at it over multiple years or compare it to your budget. Um, and then I always try to connect it to the program, to try and connect it to what's happening in the organization. Um, and I usually start off by focusing on kind of the big picture line items, so surplus and deficit. So for this organization, um, they actually uh, had a surplus in 2008, broke even in 2009, and then had a deficit. Um, and then I like to look at what's happening to the total line items. So expenses are growing, uh, revenue is shrinking. Um, not a good sign. Um, and then I like to ask myself, why? Why is this happening? Um, and then trying to dig a little further. So kind of getting to what you're saying, getting to the specific line item. So it turns out for this organization, if you notice, their government revenue is actually increasing. And so this organization thought that their service delivery was going to have to increase. So that's why they increased their expenses. But what happened at the same time with the financial crisis is that they actually lost a lot of contributed revenue. So even though they were providing more services, um, and they were getting more government revenue for it. Overall, they were um, outspending what they were receiving. Um, so a lot of people will ask, is a deficit good or bad, or how large a surplus do I need? Um, and the answer is that it depends, right? If you think back to the medical supply room, if you have more supplies um, leaving the room than new shipments coming in, you can do that if you have a lot in the room, if you have a healthy and strong balance sheet. You have a lot of supplies in the room. Um, but if that trend continues, if you continue to have more supplies going out than supplies coming in, you're eventually going to get into trouble. Um, because if you have low supplies in the room, if there are delayed shipments or small shipments or there's an emergency where people need a lot of supplies, you might be in trouble. Um, so it's the idea that you, you can incur a deficit once in a while if you have a strong balance sheet. But if you don't, um, you're eventually going to start running into trouble. So now that I'm mentioning the balance sheet, let's go there. Let me see if I can get us. So this is a balance sheet here. Um, it's a little more straightforward than the income statement. So assets are what you own. So this can include things like cash, uh, buildings and equipment, investments. It also includes what's owed to you. So here you'll see uh, receivables. So this would be accounts receivable, pledges receivable, grants receivable. Um, so money that either clients, um, funders, um, or donors owe to you that they have already promised to give you. You might also have something called prepaid expenses, um, which are basically a services that others owe to you because you've already paid for them. So some of you may prepay insurance for the year or prepay rent for the year at the beginning of the year, um, in which case prepaid expenses would show up on your balance sheet. Liabilities are what you owe to others. So this is generally uh, payables, or it might be accounts payable. So this is when you've received a bill for someone uh, for something. Um, but you haven't paid it yet. Um, you might also have something called accrued expenses, which are very similar to accounts payable. Basically, you've used services for that time period, and you haven't received the bill yet, but you know that you're going to have to pay that person or that vendor sooner or later. The most common example of this is accrued salaries. So if there's a two-week delay in your payroll, you're going to have accrued salaries on your balance sheet to represent that you still owe salary payments um, for those individuals for the time that they worked for your organization. 
Um, you might also obviously have debt on your liability section, um, and you may also have deferred revenue. Um, so that's when you receive cash in advance of providing a product or service. So you owe others that product or service because you've already received advance payment for it. The most common example of this is a university that might charge tuition in advance of the semester's classes um, or um, ticket subscriptions for a theater. A ticket has um, subscribers pay for a year's worth of production, um, or sorry, um, tickets for shows that they haven't attended yet. And so the theater company kind of owes that service to those who have purchased ticket subscriptions. And then at the bottom of your balance sheet, you're going to have a section called net assets. Um, so this is also called net worth. You can think of it as being equity or the home equity section of your balance sheet. Um, I also li always like to think about it as um, the home equity section in the sense that you can take um, the, the value of your house, um, less what you owe on it as your mortgage, and you're left with your home equity. Um, and given what's happened in the last couple of years, I hope it's positive. Um, and you'll also notice in the net assets section, there's also restrictions on them. Um, and that's because you could have 2.35 million um, of net worth. So maybe this is a combination of cash and receivables um, with no associated liabilities. Um, but they can still have donor restrictions on them. They may be cash that you have to spend on purchasing needles, um, or they may be cash that you have to spend on your education program. Um, Actually, and if we had more detail, you would actually be able to see the breakdown of restrictions for each of these line items in the balance sheet. So you could see which proportion of cash is restricted, which proportion is unrestricted, um, and likewise for all the other line items. Um, but a lot of times in audits, they, they rarely ever show that information. You only see the breakdown at the net asset level. Now, internal balance sheets tend not to look all that different. Um, generally speaking, um, I have two examples here. You're going to see more detail, right? So they may actually list the name of the checkings and savings accounts. It may list five or six different types of receivables from different clients and donors. It may list the types of buildings and equipment that you have. Um, and then the net worth, net asset section might be called something different. Um, so here it's called equity and retained earnings, which is kind of the for-profit equivalent of those terms. Um, and sometimes, depending on your software, it may not give the restriction breakdown. Um, in this example, it's called equity, but it, it, um, it does give a restriction breakdown. Um, so it really depends on how your internal software treats it. Um, but for the most part, it's not going to look significantly different. So let me take a pause there. Um, and I want to see if there are questions, if people have other terms that they um, want me to explain. Um, or you can also free, free, feel free to type in um, what are some line items that you pay attention to when you look at the balance sheet? Um, what are things that you really like to monitor um, or really try to understand the story behind? So, I'll so Vanessa, are there any responses at all? No, not currently. OK. Well, that's fine. Um, once again, feel free to ask questions if you have any. Um, but we'll go ahead and take a look at the balance sheet here. Um, so the balance sheet basically gives you a very comprehensive view of financial health, right? We think back to that medical supply room. You know, if it's fairly empty, if you don't have much, you know, the shelves are all empty, um, then you better hope that there's going to be a new shipment coming in that's going to supersede the need for things going out. Um, otherwise, you're going to be in a lot of trouble, right? Um, but if you have a well-stocked supply room, um, the shelves are full, and then you've got some breathing room. Um, and so it's the same way with, financial, with financials for your organization. If you have a very full balance sheet, and by that I mean having a lot of assets, um, less liabilities, and higher net worth, um, you're going to feel, feel like you're in a better position than if you had very low assets, high liabilities, and low net worth. Um, but that's also not the entire story, right? Because the composition of your net worth can make a big difference. So for instance, I can be running an organization that has $10 million of net worth. Um, but I'm going to feel very, very different if that $10 million is in um, a building. So I own a building that's worth $10 million and I have $0 cash. 
right? That's not a great situation to be in, and I'm probably in a panic mode, even though I have $10 million of net worth. Um, the situation would be very different if I had $0 worth of building, so I don't own a building, but I rent my space, but I have $10 million cash on the books, right? Um, probably going to feel a lot more at ease with the $10 million of cash um, rather than $10 million in the building. Um, it doesn't mean that you should never ever own a building, but it's important when you look at financial statements that you don't just look at the total numbers, right? But you also pay attention to what the breakdown is because that can make a really big difference for how healthy your organization is. And at the end of the day, the key thing that you want to pay attention to is something called uh, liquidity, which is basically your access to cash. Um, in the end of the day, it's cash that's going to pay your bills and run your program. Um, so it's something that you want to monitor very quickly. Um, and I like to use this ratio called months of cash to take a look at liquidity. Um, the basic idea is that, you know, I could say I have $10,000 in the bank. And if that's just me, Lin Shang, at Praxis, that actually doesn't feel too bad. You know, I'll take $10,000 in the bank um, because my living expenses are not that high. Um, but if I'm running a $5 million organization with only $10,000 in the bank, I'm going to be in absolute panic. So it's helpful to look at your cash relative to your operating expenses. So this is a quick ratio that you can calculate. Just take your cash balance, um, you know, either at the end of the year or at the end of the month or whenever you're reading the financial statements, and you divide by your monthly operating expenses. Um, so here I did a quick calculation, 800000 um, divided by my full year expenses divided by 12. Um, and I actually took out depreciation from that expense number um, because you never really Depreciation is not a cash expense. You never write a check out to Mr. Depreciation. Um, and so it's sometimes helpful to take that out when you're doing this ratio. So we're looking at 1.6 months of cash at fiscal year in 2010. Um, and we did the ratio for 2009, it was about two weeks, um, 0.5 months. Um, 1.6 months doesn't seem too bad. Um, you know, looks like this organization is still going to have to monitor, but they're not in panic mode. Um, but it's really when you get to three to six months that you really feel like you have a solid cushion. Um, under one month, things start to get tight. Um, and under two weeks, uh, this organization may have a little bit of a panic mode. Um, now let me just pause for a moment and wondering if anyone thinks that this seems a little strange. So this organization went from two weeks of cash to 1.6 months of cash, even though they had a huge deficit this past year. So this is something that you have to be careful of when you take a look at cash. Um, sometimes cash can be restricted. And so the, the basic ratio you calculate can be misleading. Um, so you may want to use unrestricted cash to get a more conservative estimate. Um, and so I think in this case, um, only $200,000 of their $800,000 of cash um, was actually unrestricted. Um, and so once you factor that in, this organization has less than two weeks of cash. So two weeks versus 1.6 months, like what number should you use? Um, it depends, right? So it depends on how restricted those, that cash is, right? If it's very limited, something you can only use that cash to buy needles for your needle exchange program, um, that's very limited. You can't use that cash to pay your salaries or pay your rent. Um, and so two weeks might be a better estimate for what it feels like to be at that organization. If the restriction is a little more general, say it's for um, all your education programs in 2011, um, then the 1.6 months may be more accurate because those restrictions may be something that you can draw down on pretty easily to, for their specified purpose. Um, so the main takeaway is that you should be really careful about these ratios um, and, um, and make sure that um, and make sure that you that they're a good starting point, but you always have to ask yourself to make sure you understand it. Um, I also got a question um, from Guillermo saying, how do I calculate depreciation? Um, it's generally something that you can actually find on your internal or audited financial statements. Um, it shows up in the expense section, and there'll be a line item called depreciation. Um, so you never have to calculate it yourself. Um, and for those of you who don't know, depreciation is um, it's basically an estimate of the kind of wear and tear on your buildings and equipment in a given year. Um, so it, it represents the idea that every year you kind of use up your buildings and your equipment a little bit, um, and they're worth a little less in value. Um, and so your financial statements will have a line item that says depreciation on it. Um, it's going to be larger for organizations that have buildings, um, smaller for ones that may only have equipment or computers. All right, so um, please continue to ask 
questions if you have any. I know I'm a little short on time, so I'm going to try and um, breeze really quickly through the next few slides. Um, the other warning that you have to give with months of cash is that it doesn't always reflect the fact that you have cash because you owe other people money, right? Um, I may have a loan from a bank. That's why I have cash. Or maybe I haven't really paid my rent yet. So that's why I have cash. Um, and also, it doesn't reflect the fact that there may be receivables that are going to become cash soon. So maybe I have a big outstanding receivable with the government, um, and I'm just waiting on that check. And so sometimes it's useful to calculate what's called a working capital ratio. Um, and basically, it factors in cash and receivables, and then it also factors in short-term liabilities, so payables, deferred revenue, and short-term debt. Um, and so I've calculated it here for 2010 and 2011. Uh, I'm sorry, 2010 here. Um, and it's actually very straightforward. This is the cash number. This is the receivables number. I subtracted all those liabilities and did the calculation. Um, you can also just use the unrestricted current assets to get a more conservative estimate. So let's say that $600,000 of the cash is restricted, 1.75 million receivables. That was all that restricted grant. Um, I can take it out and actually have a negative working capital number. Um, so when you look at this, the idea that you get is that including all these restricted resources, this organization is doing well. But on an unrestricted basis, things are very, very tight. Um, they actually have negative net worth on a short-term basis. Um, that doesn't mean they have to shut down, um, but it means that things are probably very tight. Um, so I like to think about this um, as a personal example. Let's say I have $6,000 of cash, right? Um, but let's say $5,000 was actually um, a tip from my mother um, who said that I have to spend that $5,000 buying furniture for my house. Um, I'm not allowed to spend it on anything else. And let's say in addition to that, I owe $2,000 in credit card debt. So even though I have $6,000 of cash in the bank, um, on an unrestricted basis for myself, I actually have negative $1,000 of, um, of working capital. Because that $6,000 cash, you got to take away the restricted money. I'm only left with $1,000. Um, and then once you take out that credit card debt of $2,000, um, I have minus $1,000. Um, doesn't mean I have to shut down, right? Uh, but it just means that I don't have very much breathing room. I have to make sure that I can bring in enough revenue to support my living expenses. Otherwise, I'm going to go even deeper in debt or, God forbid, spend down the restricted money that my mother gave me. Huh. So let me pause and see if there are any more questions. I know I had to kind of rush through the ending a little bit. Um, but I guess just to, to wrap things up, um, you know, it's, it's really important to be able to read your income statement and balance sheet. Um, both of them are going to give you insight into how to be more sustainable and how to be more successful for your mission. Um, an organization that's stronger financially is going to be most likely be able to run better programs um, and better accomplish their mission. Um, and I think a lot of you already have a good sense of your financial situation. But being able to better understand financial statements is going to help you um, communicate that story better. So I like to say, to tell the story of a uh, program in the language of finance. Um, and hopefully that's going to really um, help contribute to um, your programs and your sustainability. Um, so uh, thank you once again. Um, I'm going to pass this back to Vanessa um, so that she can wrap things up. Um, but here's my contact information. You should feel free to give me a call um, or email me if you have any questions that we weren't able to answer during today's, uh, today's session. Um, so Vanessa, let me pass this back to you. Oh, wait, I think I did it incorrectly. There we go. I think I got it. Thank you, Lin Shang. I really appreciate that. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. The slides, resources, and a recorded version of this webinar will be available on the Capacity for Health website, which is right on your screen over there. And you can also find and register for upcoming webinars and trainings by going to our upcoming trainings and webinars page. Let me quickly show you how to, how to do that. So this is our website. If you keep scrolling down, you'll see the uh, What's New section. The materials for this webinar series should be right under here. And right over here is the upcoming trainings and webinars page. We actually have the second installment of this series coming up on Tuesday, March 29th for the Money Matters webinar series. So I hope you can join us. And of course, 
feel free to stay in touch with Capacity for Health by um, signing up for our mailing list, contacting us for any of your capacity building assistance needs. As I mentioned previously, we are funded by CDC to provide free capacity building assistance in a number of different areas. So thank you for your participation in today's webinar. And I'm going to go ahead and end this um, webinar unless there, were, there's a, there are additional questions. So feel free to, end, uh, to ask them as we stay on the line for a couple more minutes. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Ling Shang, for a wonderful presentation.